Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So in the previous two two hours and a bit more, I kind of talked about basics and uh, the formulation of the data simulation problem, the estimation theory, introduction of ensemble methods. So it, you should have a kind of uh, yeah, you should have the basic framework to understand and and formulate these methods and use them also you understand should understand what's happening um, in this uh, last hour i will talk uh, more about how to solve uh, inverse problems using ensemble methods and uh, inverse pro problems is it can be is an analog to a parameter estimation problem but we will take a slightly different approach and uh, i just uh, updated the uh, presentation on my GitHub with uh, adding adding a couple more figures. So what we saw is that we have defined some kind of time interval, and uh, we have measurements in this time interval, and then the ensemble smooth wrap. That what it does is to integrate a prior ensemble over the interval, and then compute one update using all the measurements. So in this case, you don't split. Uh, yeah, the, there's no time recursion in the processing of measurements. Um, then we saw that the update step in the ensemble can be smoother. Then you make an ensemble prediction to a certain time. Then you have a measurement. And then you update all the realizations to get a new set of realizations here. And but at the same time, you also update backwards in time. So you get an esti improved estimate for previous times. And then from here, you can continue integration to make a prediction. Um, then the, in the ensemble camera filter, you do exactly the same. You compute exactly the same update, but you don't bother about what happened in the past because you're only interested in the future. And uh, but this is a bit different from uh, what's being done in uh, in weather forecasting, for example. Uh, in weather forecasting, then you have you again define a time window, and now I, uh, the times actually make a bit more sense. But it, now it's here we have a twelve-hour time window, and then we assume that we have measurements taken at different instances in time over this window. Not that this can, you can also use the ENKF <clears throat> for the same problem. But then if you had measurements at different times, you would compute the difference between the measurements and the prediction at these times, but you would still update at the final time of the window. But then you use time correlations between the measure, measurements and the, the predicted measurements and the measurement and, and the variables you're updating here. Um, but in, in, in uh, weather prediction, you do it differently. Instead of updating at the final time and continuing integration, you update at the start time of the window. And this is uh, it's a nature of the methods that have been traditionally used in, uh, in weather forecasting. They use so-called 40 bar uh, methods. And then you you try to fit initial or find initial conditions that give uh, more predictions that fits a set of measurements over a time window, and then we use continued integration to make a prediction. Um, it turns out that this is uh, useful also for uh, par parameter estimation, because you can imagine that what you have is a set of initial parameters, and you make a prediction, ensemble prediction, given these parameters. Then you have some measurements of the prediction, and you try to update the parameters so that your predictions are close to the measured solution. So in a way, what we have in the, what we define now is that uh, we start with an ensemble of uncertain inputs. And these inputs can be anything. It can be the initial conditions. It can be the parameters of the model. It can be control variables forcing the model. And it can be model errors. 
So it's, it's quite general. Then this goes into the model and the model can also be general. It can be a sequence of models, like in, uh, in uh, reservoir management, you have a geological model where you model the whole reservoir with geological properties. Then you have a simulation model. This outputs a simulation model. So you can run through the simulation model. And then if the measurements are, for example, seismic data, then you have a forward seismic model. So it can be a model process or a workflow. So the inputs can be things like uh, parameters, like channel directions and uh, structural surfaces, etc. So it can be really abstract and very general. And the outputs uh, is something that you have measured. And then you propagate uh, the, the ensemble through this whole process to get an ensemble of uncertain outputs that you measure. So you have measurements of these. And then you use the correlations between these outputs and these inputs to update the inputs. So you reduce the uncertainty in the inputs and you can run through the ensemble process again to get a new prediction. So this is it's very different from what we talked about before uh, when we discussed parameter estimation, because then we had a recursive updating of, of the parameters with time. Well, here you go back to the to a start time and update all the parameters, and then you run the model again. But of course, this, this can be defined on a window like this, but it also could can be done recursively on windows following each other. So it's quite general. And just to explain, I made this illustration once to explain what is actually happening in these parameter estimation problems. Suppose we have a prior parameter value and we have number, a number of realizations of it. So we have sampled it. And then we make a prediction forward in time. So we get some predicted measurements here. And this is the real observation. And what we see here is that uh, for these parameter values, we are underestimating the observation. From this example, it's also clear that it seems like if we increase the value of the parameter, we will be able to get closer to the measurement. And that's exactly what we do. We are using a statistical regression, that is the correlation between the predicted measurements and the initial parameters. And since, since here we see that increasing parameter values results in increasing uh, prediction values, it's clear that, that there is a positive correlation between these predicted measurements and the uh, prior parameter ensemble. So we use these uh, positive covariances or correlations to, to update our initial parameters such that we get a better uh, fit to the measurement. And of course, this is a really simple example. It's a scalar input and it's a scalar output. And it's, uh, it's almost like a linear model because uh, no, it seems like uh, a linear response uh, here compared to the inputs. So, so it's a very simple example. Uh, however, the, using these ensemble methods, we are dealing with problems where you have thousands of input parameters, you have thousands of measurements, the different parameters can be correlated or uncorrelated, you have different variances. Uh, some parameters uh, gives a positive contribution to the uh, prediction, other parameters gives a negative contribution. And then the measurements can be also uh, well, they can have a correlated errors that can be dependent information in the measurements. And uh, the real high dimension and nonlinear problem becomes really uh, hard to tackle and it's difficult to solve. But uh, using ensemble methods, as long as there is a, a monotonic impact from the measurements, they will always give you a solution. And by monotonic, it means that if you increase uh, the value of a parameter, there should be a monotonic response. It should either increase or decrease uh, in the predicted measurement. And uh, this is the idea behind uh, doing parameter estimation or inverse modeling in uh, solving inverse problems using ensemble methods. 
And then uh, let's look at uh, a little example here. I call this the indirect data simulation update. Suppose we have a nonlinear model. We start with x at time i. We have a nonlinear model that makes a prediction at time i plus 1. And then if in, before I also only talked about linear measurement operators, but th these, of course, can be nonlinear as well. So you can say that uh, if we start with the model, we make an integration, and then we have a nonlinear functional operating on the prediction. To then we get a predicted measurement, right? So the predicted measurement uh, can be written as, as y, and it's just a function of the inputs, which was the initial condition from the previous time. So then we have measurements of these predicted measure, predicted measurements. And we write up the Bayesian formulation for this problem. And then we find that the probability of x i, that means the, the inputs, and the predicted measurement, given the, the, the measurements, is proportional to this expression here. And what we have here is that we have a prior for the inputs. We have a model evolution. That, that's the probability of the predicted measurements given these inputs. And we have the likelihood function. And I call this a smoother update step in sequential data simulation. And it's quite similar to what's being done in, uh, in weather forecasting. Okay? You, you try to estimate this xi given these measurements. And xi is at the beginning of the time window. It's the input to the system. Okay, let's, let's look at the, the similar setup for parameter estimation problem. Then you start with input parameters x, and you have a predicted measurements y, and we have the real measurements. And again, you have exactly the same form of the Bayesian formulation, except you have removed the i on x here. And so this is a standard Bayesian inverse problem. And this can be simplified a little bit because you are not trying to estimate y, you are trying to estimate x. So you can integrate out the, the y value. Uh, yeah. So and, and also in this case, we will now assume that the model is perfect. There are no model errors. Or if there are model errors, they are contained in the x. So we say that y is equal to g of x. So this is our basic problem. We have the Bayesian uh, formulation. And if the model is perfect, then this transition density is just a delta function. This just means that for a given x, there is a unique y. Okay, So it's a deterministic model. And if we integrate this formulation over y, then we get the marginal for x given the data. And since this is just a delta function, it means that we can set y equals to g of x in, in the likelihood. So this is our new formulation for Bayes theorem and the one we are going to solve. <clears throat> OK. Uh, I hope this is, uh, is, uh, is clear. Just to illustrate what we have, we have uh, this red PDF of x, which is our prior. We make a prediction, so we get the red prediction here of y. Then we have a likelihood function for the measurements in blue. Then we combine this information to update the PDF for x. So this is our update. And then we run a new prediction to get the posterior PDF. Okay. And if we assume that we have Gaussian priors, and uh, yeah, then we can use uh, a method, what we call a randomized maximum likelihood sampling. It's an approximate sampling of the posterior PDF here. And it's possible to show that uh, uh, if you minimize an ensemble of cost functions written in this form, where you have a prior misfit and a data misfit, then this approximately samples the posterior PDF. 
if this g is linear, then this corresponds to the update step in the ensemble gamma filter. And you will get exactly the ensemble gamma filter equations uh, out of minimizing these cost functions. But now we allow for a nonlinear model and nonlinear measurement operators. We make the problem a bit more uh, yeah, uh, complicated, I guess. Um, anyway, we can minimize these cost functions using the ensemble smoother. Uh, we can use, yeah, the problem with that is that you need to linearize this equation. So we'll, you will get an approximate solution that's only valid for small updates. On the other hand, you can also define iterative methods for solving this problem. And there is one method called iterative ensemble smoother, it's called ensemble randomized maximum likelihood method by Chen and Oliver that minimizes these cost functions. Um, I'm not sure how much I should go into detail there, but you get a much better solution than you will have with the ensemble smoother. Um, and then there's another approach, which is called ensemble smoother with multiple data simulation that is it's not minimizing these cost functions, but it's reformulating uh, Bayes theorem to recursively introduce the impact of the measurements. So I'll explain what that means in a second. But the point is that uh, we can solve this one approximately using ensemble, ensemble smoother or ensemble filter equations. Method. This is a true iterative method. This is some kind of recursive uh, method. So Sorry, if yeah, we yeah, you've been, uh, the ensemble yeah. yeah, you've been interrupted a bit. Could you repeat the last sentence about the NKS and QF? Uh, okay. I start from here. So, yeah, okay. It's a bit noisy outside now. It's a plane here. Um, okay, so what I said is that minimizing this ensemble of cost functions is equivalent to sampling this posterior PDF in the linear case. For a nonlinear case, it's an approximate sampling of the posterior. Then also, if G is linear, then this corresponds to uh, the ensemble Kalman filter update. So you can derive directly the ensemble Kalman filter update equations. Um, so that means the ensemble Kalman filter equations will also in the linear case, that will exactly sample the posterior PDF. In the nonlinear case, it's an approximate sampling. And the three methods we have for handling this now, for, of, as far as I know, is uh, an ensemble smoother solution where you need to linearize this equation, what is G, so you get an approximate solution. But then there is an iterative ensemble smoother method that avoids it, this linearizations and solves these equations exactly. And there is a third uh, approach where you call ESMDA, where you, you temper the uh, taper the likelihood and introduce gradually the impact of measurements. And uh, by doing that, you reduce the impact of linearizations in the, you use the same smoother equations, but you have uh, many small steps instead of one large, so the impact of linearization is much smaller. But I'll explain a bit more uh, what the methods are doing. So the ensemble smoother, then you compute a gradient, looks like this, uh, and you want to solve for xj, but then you see that xj is here and it's also in this function, so you need to, you cannot, there's no explicit solution of this equation as it is here. So what we do is to linearize g of xj around the prior or the first guess, and then you introduce this uh, uh, tangent linear operator again. And uh, okay, if you do that, then uh, it's possible to solve for xj. And when you do that, you get the gamma filter equations again. Um, in addition, this G is the tangent linear operator of the model. So it's the derivatives of the model operator. And what we do is to 
replace this with a, a kind of uh, least squares regression estimator. So you define G to be CYX times CXX to the minus one, which is the best uh, least squares fit for this. So be, instead of using individual uh, tangent linear matrices for each realization, we use one common representation of this model sensitivity represented by the ensemble statistics. And then we use ensemble covariances, of course. So the way the ensemble smooth to then works is that you sample this XF, the priors, from a normal distribution. You sample the measurement, perturbed measurements. You compute a forward integration to, of the predicted measurements. You compute an update of X using these correlations between the predicted measurement and the state and uh, using the standard uh, common filter equation. And then you rerun uh, the model with up, from the updated initial conditions to get the new prediction. And uh, unfortunately, this linearization might be quite severe in uh, for, for more stronger nonlinearities. And then uh, it means that the solution will only be good for really small updates. Um, the iterative ensemble smoothers do it differently. They take the same cost functions, they compute the gradient, same as before, compute the Hessian as a second derivative of the cost function, and then you define a Gauss Newton iteration in this form. So you have, uh, yeah, so you have to iterate, uh, you make, uh, you update your, your best guess, the I is the iteration index use it in the gradient direction and it's normalized by the Hessian. And then when you have a new estimate of X, you run the model again to get a new prediction. So do you iterate until convergence? And in that case, you would solve exactly this problem if you use the tangent linear operator, but you add an additional approximation by, oops, by, sorry, huh? Yeah, by using this linear regression approximation as well. But uh, you are then able to get quite accurate solutions of, uh, of this problem. So what you have is a number of cost functions, an ensemble of cost functions. If you compute the ensemble smoother solution, you go one long step and you see you end up here, which is not exactly at the minimum. Same with for this one. So while well, if you do this iterative method, you go a shorter first step and then it converges towards something which is fairly close to the minimum. It will never be exactly the minimum because you have uh, applied this linear regression approximation. So that means you're using ensemble gradients and you avoid using uh, adjoints and tangent linear operators. But if you have the adjoint, then you could avoid this approximation and uh, in that case, the iterative ensemble smoothers will get you exactly to the minimum. Okay, this is uh, it's a lot of information now. Uh, the ESMDA is taking a different approach. It starts again with base, and then it says that the likelihood to the power one uh, is the same as, as this one, so we don't change anything. You take the likelihood to this power, and this power is equal to, to 1. But when you have this sum, you can write the likelihood uh, as a product of many likelihoods. And if you have Gaussian distributions, this just means that you uh, will gradually introduce uh, the impact of a measurement. So instead of computing one big update, you're computing many small updates. But for a lin Gauss linear system, the solution will be exactly the same going through this process as going through this process. So, so there is no approximation in, in, uh, in this uh, rewriting of the likelihood. Um, so what you do in ESMDA is that you compute a number, now it's called N here, uh, ensemble smoother steps with inflated observation errors. 
And these small updates reduce the impact of this linearization. So if the steps are small enough, then there will be no significance of that linearization. And in the linear case, the solution you get here is identical. You are sampling, you get exactly the same distribution from ESMDA as from uh, ES. In the nonlinear case, it will always give a better solution. And the only thing that's important is that you need to resample the measurements arrows for each update step here. Otherwise, you, you get some inbreeding and it doesn't work. And uh, there is a number of publications. Uh, it's the one by Chen and Oliver, where we introduced this e uh, ensemble randomized maximum likelihood, ENRML. It's the American Reynolds uh, paper on uh, ESMDA. And then uh, I have some papers on uh, trying to analyze these iterative smoothers uh, a bit more. Uh, introducing model errors. Uh, there's a paper on uh, and subspace implementation. And uh, there's also a paper by Patrick and, and uh, Mina uh, and uh, Stodal on, on the same method. So, but uh, it's the same method, but slightly different formulations. And I list this one here because that's the one I've been uh, using myself. Yeah. Uh, there's a discussion or a question if um, first of all, this, these methods has to be characterized some some kind of uh, statistical optimization methods, and they are approximate. Um, they will also work as long as you have monotonic. Uh, uh, model response to the inputs. So if you have examples with uh, really non-Gaussian, no, not Gaussian, non-monotonic uh, uh, impacts, like if you start increasing the value of, of a parameter, then the model response increases. But then at some point it starts decreasing again. Then you get typical bimodal problems. And then anything that uses a statistical gradient or statistical model sensitivity will fail. So, um, but how this relates to Hamiltonian Monte Carlo methods, I'm not sure because I, I don't uh, really know exactly what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo approach is. But if someone knows, they can write the answer in the in the feed. Yeah, and then uh, so so what? What I want to say here is that you can formulate problems where this value x can contain initial conditions uh, for a time window. It can contain uh, parameters in the model. It can contain control variables as a function of time that's forcing the model. And it could include model errors. And so it's, it's quite general in its, its formulation. And uh, we used uh, we have been using these methods for petroleum applications for uh, for some years now, and they work quite well. And then I wanted to include one example where we used it for a, a kind of SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, the, the COVID uh, uh, predictions. And this is published. It's in a paper uh, in. Fundamentals of Data Science, that's uh, AIMS, one of the AIMS journals. And uh, there was a lot of authors in the data simulation community involved in this paper. So you probably recognize many of them. And uh, from a number of countries. And the idea was to develop data simulation methods and show how they can be used to control and update and calibrate uh, models for uh, predicting the COVID uh, virus or the, no, the COVID pandemic. Um, and we ran, uh, we developed a system and we ran it for multiple uh, countries and calibrated the data. So I show one example now. 
Uh, first of all, the, the measurements, it's, it's a quite a tricky problem, this uh, COVID uh, problem. Uh, the measurements we have is uh, the number of hospitalized, uh, sometimes within different age groups and gender. Uh, we have the number of deaths, some are at hospitals, others are at care homes or in private homes. In some cases, we have the number of positive tests, but this, at least at the beginning, it was highly underreported and was really hard to use. Um, and then we started out with uh, what's called a SAIR model. It's a susceptible, exposed, infectious and recovered model. And this uh, doesn't predict deaths and hospitalizations. We had to extend the model. So we made uh, a model system that looks like this. You have a susceptible population. That's all the, the population that can get infected by the, the COVID virus. And uh, we also split uh, this into age classes because we realized that different age classes are uh, get different symptoms, right? It's mostly the elderly that die or get severely sick, while the kids, young ones, uh, don't get uh, any severe symptoms. So we used, uh, in this case, 11 age classes. And then uh, these are interacting with infectious patients in the different age classes and become exposed. So we move uh, susceptible to exposed when they get infected. And after a few days, they, the exposed also becomes infectious. And then after having been sick with COVID, you either, as soon as you know that you are sick, you end up in a quarantine group where you stop infecting others because you hide at home or uh, you're in an isolate somewhere. And uh, then you go into three different groups. So it's either those with mild symptoms or M, severe symptoms and fatal symptoms. Those with mild, mild symptoms just recover after some time and end up in this blue group here. Those with severe symptoms get hospitalized and after some time they also recover. And those with fatal symptoms are either being hospitalized and then they die or they are maybe stuck in a care home and then they die. So this is kind of the, the flow of uh, the population through the system. Um, yeah, so and, and with this model, we managed to get quite a realistic uh, uh, a model, realistically, the behavior of the population or with how people got infected and treated and recovered, etc. Um, the equations are listed here. So we have uh, it's just a system of ordinary differential equations. So we have uh, 11 of each of these, that's the different age classes. We have these three Qs. We have the hospitalized, uh, those in care homes, the recovered, and those dying. And uh, we, we used to find time scales between, for the transitions between different uh, groups or categories. And uh, of course, this model is, is still fairly simple because you don't model individual persons and you don't differentiate between cities and uh, etc. So we use these aggregated variables. So you need sufficient number of uh, people in the in the system to have a uh, statistical significance. But still, uh, these models seems to quite realistically model epidemics. So they are used uh, used heavily. More sophisticated model could be more use kind of particle representations where you model each individual and uh, use uh, like cell phone data to see how people are moving around and in contact with others etc but then you again you get i'm not sure if you get much more information out of the or much more real, reliable predictions because uh, there are a lot more parameters to to estimate them um, also we neglected import of cases uh, so we took, could take one country and model it in the or one region and model it independently of other regions, and that was okay during the initial lockdown of the, the pandemic. Uh, and it's a simple model, so it's a 
it's, it took us uh, a week or two to have the full system up and running. Um, and then uh, there are lots of parameters in the model. And uh, it's like here, you see, this is the, uh, the fraction of different age groups. These are the ages uh, that get uh, mild, severe, and fatal symptoms. And, uh, and all of these data we took from uh, international databases that were developed quite quickly uh, uh, during the early pandemic. And then we had also time scales that were estimated quite well uh, from data in uh, different publications, etc. And uh, these we also treated as uncertain model parameters and estimated and using uh, the data simulation methods. And uh, I think key to this study is that we need to define uh, this effective reproductive number, the R of T. And uh, that basically describes how much people are in contact, how much, uh, how many, how, how much you tra transfer disease between within a population. And uh, we modeled it as a scalar function of time. And uh, we had this matrix that defines how the interaction is between different age classes. Um, yes, and what, what's uh, interesting with this is that the way people behave, say two weeks uh, ago, determines the number of people dying and being hospitalized today. And that basically means that if you treat this as a recursive or sequential data simulation problem, it's not enough to update R and the populations today because uh, today it can be completely different, right? You need to update two weeks ago to get the correct prediction today. So, and what we concluded or found was that we could estimate ROT from the past. So we can, and R is, it's really the uh, variable or, or control variable that drives the whole system. So by increasing and reducing R as a function of time, we we increase the number of people being infected and uh, again, the number of people going to the hospitals or, and dying. And then to make predictions, we have to make some assumption about R for the future. And uh, this, that means we have to know something about what the politicians are deciding. Is there a full lockdown? Are people locked up at, at home? Then R goes down. Uh, if you are in some countries where we, they didn't really implement any measures, then there's much more interaction between people and we know R is, uh, goes up. And uh, uh, for data simulation, we used the ESMDA. The reason was that uh, it was what we could most quickly have up running. Uh, it's really easy to implement because you can use the standard ENKF uh, update algorithm routines and you just uh, inflate, call it many times and inflate the measurements uh, measurement errors for each each step. And uh, it's also efficient for large ensemble sizes. So in this case, we actually used 5,000 realizations and 32 steps. And we made some uh, sensitivity studies and it was impossible to visualize any difference in the results uh, if we went from 32 to 16 or uh, if, you read, if you increased the number of realizations more. So uh, it was really a converged solution and it's complete overkill in most applications, but at least no, there are no sampling errors in, uh, in the system. And we are using enough steps, in the ESMDS steps that there, there should be no linearization effect on the updates. And uh, I just, this is just one early example from the, I think it's from the paper. Or, or maybe it was just run just off the maybe it's a, a, the paper went in around here. Now it's a it's a slightly up. It was from last summer, but then this is the simulations we had when we believed everything was under control in Norway, because we had this initial uh, number of uh, wave or, or hospitalizations and uh, people dying, and uh, we also estimated ours, which was quite high initially, 
and then uh, we made a discontinuous, discontinuous R year, but we got a really low R in the lockdown period, which started mid March, and we got down to point two, three, four or so in R values within the lockdown. And in Norway, people people basically stayed home and didn't go out. Everything was shut, and uh, people were really careful. And then uh, uh, it kind of stabilized with an R value around 0.8. And uh, yeah, until uh, I think uh, end of June or so. And uh, if you look at the number of active cases, it's kind of decreasing exponentially here. So uh, in, yeah, in uh, mid July, there were maybe 1000 active cases left in Norway and we had complete control of the pandemic and there was no reason that this should not be dying out completely and, and yeah society should recover but of course uh, politicians they don't understand mathematics and they don't understand uh, differential equations and in particular they don't understand unstable differential equations and uh, the problem with this corona or the, these pandemics and the coronavirus is that as soon as people start interacting again, you only need one case to start for it to start spreading, and it spreads exponentially, right? So uh, you have to get it completely rid of it before you start opening up. And uh, in Norway, they open up the borders. People started going to vacation and uh, partying in, in uh, Spain, made mostly. And uh, we also opened the borders for immigrant workers. We have a lot of people from uh, Poland, Lithuania, and different places that work in construction in Norway, and they didn't have to do any quarantine or test or anything. So during the autumn, this didn't, this went completely wrong. So then basically R increased. And uh, I, I'll come back to that, but we also used this uh, to, to simulate, make sensitivity studies. So we have uh, this was done quite early. So in uh, uh, in April, the government started uh, discussing if they should open schools again. And then we used the system to simulate different scenarios with different future R's. So you have a stable scenario, the neutral scenario and the unstable scenario, just to explain the impact of, uh, what could be the impact of opening schools. And what we saw was that uh, we would, uh, yeah, most likely we would have uh, an, end up in something around one or maybe a bit below, and that which was we found the most likely. And uh, but it was a really sensitive situation. And if you get too much infections am among children, then you would have to uh, reduce infection among adults. So you need stricter measures elsewhere in society. But we wanted to explain that this is a really unstable system that is really hard to, to control in retrospect by changing measures. Okay, Because when you see something happening, if, there, if the system goes unstable, then you only know, then that happened two, three weeks ago. So you, you start acting very late and then it uh, takes time. I, I, I think I'll skip some of these. Uh, one thing we saw that in the US, we realized that you actually got quite a good, good funny results for R, but then you see that you actually follow the measurements quite well. And it turned out that we could connect some of these bumps in R to, to political decisions or events where uh, you got increased spreading. And, uh, and that was quite interesting. Um, I will just show you, this is an example in Norway that we ran, I ran in uh, April. And you see that this is the initial wave. And then it was really low for a long time. But in July, R started going above uh, one and you started increasing the number of infections. And, and then you got this uh, exponential growth here with uh, uh, lots of hospitalizations. We almost came back to what we had initially and uh, additional people dying again. And uh, if we use the model like this and, and estimate, um, then we get a good estimate of R throughout the, the history, but we have to guess for the future. And 
in this case, this is, I guess, where we assume that R is larger than one. Uh, this bump here, or increase here, is due to the mutations of the virus, because you get more infective variants of the virus. So that, that means we got this last wave. Fortunately, now it's, uh, it's uh, going down again. But there was one thing uh, missing here, and we see that this prediction is not really fitting the data. The data seems to flatten out the number of uh, deaths, while we have an exponential increase in the number of deaths here. And that turned out to be an impact of uh, vaccination. So we, we had a vaccination plan for the, these are the elderly and for different age groups that kind of, uh, you, as you vaccinate the oldest first and then you start vaccinating younger and younger groups with time. So you move people from the susceptible to, to recover basically or vaccinated groups. And uh, the impact of this is that you, you got a much more realistic uh, uh, or much better fit to the data where things don't, uh, yeah, it, fit, uh, yeah it, it, se it seems to be more realistic. And I'm not sure if I have, uh, the, I have some later simulations and we basically fit this quite well. And so now it looks quite good, but maybe if uh, the Indian uh, mutation or uh, if the vaccine is not effective on this, then we will have another go again at this. So in a way, we are not finished. Um, but what we showed in this case is that we can estimate this past R. So we can estimate control parameters driving the model. And we are using it for the corona case, but we are also using it in uh, petroleum applications where we estimate uh, the production uh, rates uh, from uh, oil wells, etc., and correct those. And we could uh, quantify the imp impact of interventions. Uh, uh, we could do short-term forecasting using R persistence. That means we, we just use what we know about the situation and the uh, lockdowns and, uh, for the next weeks. And those uh, predictions were, works uh, quite well. And then we can do long-term scenario forecasting. The code used in this study is available from GitHub, including all the examples and the documentation. So if you are, you are welcome to look at that if you want. And I think, uh, yeah, also the current state is that uh, we have extended the code to support multiple countries that interact. So you can model all the countries in Europe and include interaction between the countries. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we included this term for conversation term for vaccinations. Uh, and I, I think that what, what we, we have a situation today and it looks, looks fairly promising, but we are not finished with the coronavirus yet. So I think there will be new mutations and uh, new uh, epidemics spreading again later, so uh, there are still a lot of work to do with this model, so in case you are interested. I think I'll stop there, then we have 10 minutes for discussions, or maybe I have 15, I'm not sure. Thanks, Gerh. Yeah. And there's a chat uh, message from uh, Natalie Tox saying, asking if you can put the the link of the of the of the, um, the address of the publication. Uh, it's here. It's this one. And uh, the easiest, if you don't want to write it, just go to uh, my GitHub, and the link is also in the documentation there. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks very well. And uh, I could also say that uh, this system is now being used in quite a number of applications. It has been used more in the US. So there's another paper in the re review process where, you, where they look at uh, the impact of the corona on different ethnic groups. It's used in Switzerland uh, by researchers there. Yeah. So. Uh, and in my opinion, it, it's uh, the correct way of calibrating these models and actually using data simulation. Of course, there is a lot of uh, 
it's not easy to get into the epidemic modeling community because they have their own systems uh, and they don't like us, us data assimilators to interfere, but uh, still I think what we are doing is better now. Okay, there's another question from Korea about the, uh, the, uh, the case studies. Did they include uh, the uh, data files for the number of uh, hospitalized and dead? Yeah, uh, maybe I, I will uh, make a little switch. I can stop sharing and sharing again. And then I do my whole desktop and move this here. So if you go here, then this is the GitHub and there is a full, full documentation um, of how to install, how to run it, etc. And uh, I think in runs, yeah, these are the runs done for the different countries. And in all of these, you will find the different cases we run with all the input matrices, etc. Just note that if you are going to, and there's also a script here, um, this one that runs, this runs all the cases. And uh, the only thing uh, I should say is that to run these cases, you need to use this version, the paper version of the, of the code. Because uh, the new version has slightly different input files or naming conventions since I'm using multiple countries, etc. Yeah, and that should be okay then. Yeah. But I, I think it's possible, you will be able to, if you have a Linux system, to install and get it to run in the, in the first try. It's, a, it's not a promise, but it's, a, it's likely. And it's also when you run the model for the first time, there is only one or two files you need to input files you need to specify the orders are automatically generated as template files so no. okay the questions coming out in the online documents too <laughs> uh, yeah are you sharing the results well, I'm sharing it by publishing it, and uh, I am I have communicated the Norwegian results to the Norwegian government, and uh, I think initially uh, they were used. Uh, on the other hand, I see it's really hard coming from the outside to to really uh, have a big impact on decisions, and decisions are made using model results, but also all kinds of economic projections. And uh, so uh, in my opinion, uh, most countries have handled the epidemics wrongly or poorly. And uh, yeah, so, but that's, uh, so I don't agree with uh, the, the way it's done in, neither in Norway than more, or most other countries. I think New Zealand and uh, Australia has taken a much more sensible approach. It's like you, we had discussions initially of uh, estimating automatic feedback in terms of interventions to manage the epidemic. So that means you say that, okay, we are okay with 1000 cases a day, but it should not increase. And what kind of interventions do you need to manage that? And uh, in my, my opinion, that's impossible because you have a completely unstable system and uh, it's not manageable. And in particular, particular, since you have this delay of two weeks or so before you see the impact of your behavior.
Yeah, this, uh, what I can say here, any uh, plans of further advance in the project? Well, it is uh, being advanced uh, all the time. So these vaccines we implemented maybe a month ago, uh, month or two, and uh, dealing with new viruses is quite straight, or variants of the virus is quite straightforward because that only impacts the value of R. So if it's more infectious, then R increases. So uh, um, what would take a bit more uh, effort is if different variants are, have, are more deadly or not. That's, uh, yes, and that's, uh, yes, we can start uh, the way the system is set up now. We can model as many countries as we like and we define uh, actually, in the in here, there is uh, some examples. This is the new model. It's a bit different from what was in the in the original presentation. But you see, you have an equation for the vaccinated, and you have. Uh, this R term that's quite complex, but it includes the the interaction between country N and M, and uh, yeah. So uh, so here you can. Now this is the way the model looks like. So you have the vaccinated group and you have the recovered groups here. So from S you go either from uh, to exposed or to vaccinated. And you have this index over the countries. So you can have as many countries or regions or cities or whatever that you like. And uh, what that also can say is that there's a number of repositories here. Uh, this one, ENKF analysis, is a repository containing a Fortran, impl Fortran anti implementation of the ENKF analysis scheme, the way I'm doing it. And uh, it's the, it compiles into a library that you can call from uh, any of the applications. For example, if you want to, uh, yeah, this is uh, a scalar example I'm using. Um, um, yeah, this Lorenz, that's my Lorenz equation repository. And again, with uh, installation information. And uh, what it says is, for example, here you need to uh, clone this one the sampling one and the analysis one, and uh, and then you compile it. Uh, yeah, you just make build like this for the different ones: the sampling, analysis, and the runs, and it should be ready to run. It's a lot of advertisement. The number of forward model runs, yes. Oh, yes, it depends of the nonlinearity of the model. Um, I think in reservoir applications, we have been using IES with uh, five to 10 iterations. ESMDA MDA the same, but uh, we see that ESMDA probably need more, like 16 or to get a fully converged solution. Yeah, this uh, question about the uh, transfer matrix between age groups. We used, uh, we didn't have any data for Norway on that. So in Norway, it was used to increase transmission among children and their parents if they went back to school and we, we opened schools. 
in the UK, they had some more data and uh, were actually were used that in the modeling. Yes, it can predict if herd immunity has been achieved. This, uh, the question being written now about expensive forward runs, that's actually what we have, the case we have with uh, reservoir models. Uh, it takes, depending on the model, from uh, at least some minutes, but uh, maybe uh, two, three hours to run one model simulation. But then we run on Linux clusters, so everything is going in parallel. Is there something I'm missing now? Or... I don't see any more questions on the online form, but if there are any more questions in the audience, you can try to raise hand and we have still 15 minutes before the break. This is the Norwegian silence. <laughs> no. Well, if um, there is no more questions, we can, uh, yeah. I have more can slides, I but uh, the coffee break. Yeah. I have more slides, but I have no more voice. So it's uh... yeah. <laughs> you should have pre-recorded your presentation, I guess. Yeah. Uh, no, but uh, well, most people are online now. Uh, I think it's okay if we can move forward uh, the next session just to, by fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, we can break for coffee now, and uh, ask Patrick and everybody to come back at. Uh, at um, yeah, in 50 minutes from now, so 2.20. What do you okay. think? Is that okay with you, Patrick? Sounds good. Yeah. In uh, that case, I will just thank you all for listening. And uh, if you have any more questions, it's possible to either email me or post it in this. Uh, this discussion i can be yeah yeah so uh, yeah it's, it's possible that questions will come uh, with answers uh, only in a, in a few days from now mm -hmm. thank you okay. yeah, thanks a lot yeah bye-bye yeah.